Okay, we can continue. The next slide. Yes. As far as how we calculate that levy limit, um, our finance officer handles that, and the calculation and the adjustments can be seen on pages 16 and 17 of your um, uh, left of your budget book. Uh, but basically, the main adjustment is net new construction, and for 2020, that was 1.226 percent, which yielded an increase in the levy of just over $55,000. Uh, this year, we have no joint fire department uh, credit to take on our levy limit. Uh, that's because our costs through Lake Country and Fire Rescue went down, and you can only take a credit if, uh, uh, if your costs uh, increase by, uh, by a certain amount. Um, then the last couple of adjustments that you'll see on pages 16 and 17 are for debt service and personal property adjustment. Uh, debt service, as we've talked about before, uh, automatically adjust. So if your debt service goes up from one year to another, uh, your levy limit goes up by that amount. If your debt service goes down from one year to another, your levy limit goes down by that amount. So when we talk about um, capital projects not impacting um, the city's levy limit, uh, that's what we're talking about with that. So this next slide with the um, net new construction. Uh, this kind of graphs net new construction and consumer price index, which is a pretty good gauge of um, really the sustainability of levy limits. And when you look at the last four years, um, our net new construction has not um, uh, measured up to uh, CPI or some case of CPI, and um, that's a contributing factor to our uh, budget deficit. Next slide. So we look at the budget, there are two recommended budgets, a budget A and a budget B. Uh, budget A assumes the referendum passes and maintains existing staffing and service levels. It includes a 2% increase uh, for employees. And you can see the summary for budget A on pages 26 and 28 of your budget book. Uh, conversely, budget B assumes referendum fails. Uh, it includes elimination of a police officer position, a public works position, uh, and an administrative employee. Uh, it also decreases the assumed pay increase for employees to 1.19%, uh, which is the amount that we needed to adjust it to uh, to yield a uh, balanced budget. Next slide. As far as the components of the levy, there's, there's three components as we've talked about in the past years. Uh, those components are our general fund levy, our debt service levy, and then the library levy. And shown on the slide, you can see what the 2020 adopted levy was for each of those three components, you know, what the total levy was. And then for 2021, I show three different amounts. Uh, first of all, we show the allowable levy with if the referendum passes, that yields that $6.68 million levy we talked about. Uh, the next one is budget A recommended. And you'll see that under the recommended budget A, although we are allowed to levy 6.68 million, um, we're not proposing to take advantage of that full referendum amount in this first year. Uh, and we will be looking at a levy of just over 6.6 million, 6.61. And then lastly, is the levy for um, just what the state allows us to increase the levy without the referendum. That would also be our uh, levy with the uh, failed referendum. Next slide. So the general fund component of the levy, um, that's the property tax funding for the city's primary operating activities, including admin, public safety, and, and public works. So this is the area that um, if we need to cut our budget, this is where um, the city has leverage to, to make those cuts. Um, the other sections, the other components of the levy, the library, uh, that's pretty much locked in by the, um, uh, by the county uh, minimum funding requirement. And then uh, our web debt service levy is also established based on past file. As far as highlights in the general fund levy, uh, things I want to get on. Um, first of all, what's a major concern throughout most of this year that it is a distinct possibility that the state would significantly decrease our share of revenue and our transportation aid. Uh, very recently, we received um, notification from the state uh, and estimates on 
the remaining payments for this year and the payments for next year, and they don't reflect any cuts. So we're very stable with that. Uh, so we're very pleased with what we heard back from the state. Um, I understand that they have very strong revenues in year 2019, um, which kind of made up for uh, most of the lost revenue, revenue in 2020. That in the biennium budget that they are actually um, ahead with regards to the budget revenue. So uh, that's helpful good news. Um, health insurance costs is a piece of bad news. Uh, health insurance costs went up by over 10%. Um, that is um, not consistent with what we've been seeing with our health insurance over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, we've seen actually five decreases in the last seven years in health insurance costs. And if you look at the last 10 years of health insurance changes, which is in your budget book in my transmittal letter, you'll see that over 10 years, the average annual increase in our health insurance is less than two tenths of a percent. Police department staffing. Uh, this has been a major development since um, we established what the referendum amount would be. We have had a retirement in the police department. And the police department uh, doesn't intend to fill that position uh, until at least June 1st of next year. So budget A now reflects that. And that's the primary contributing factor as to why um, next year we can um, fund budget A uh, with, uh, with something less than what we're asking for in the referendum. Also, in the police department, we made the adjustment to remove their squad car and equipment purchase uh, from the operating budget, move that into the capital budget. Uh, we will structure that budget check uh, appropriately so that uh, it will match the uh, six year useful life of the police squad car. <clears throat> Next, we all know about um, the good news of Lake Country Fire and Rescue this year. Uh, there's actually two good pieces of news, at least two, uh, with regards to the budget. Uh, first of all, our contribution to Lake Country Fire and Rescue due to the merger uh, will be more than $35,000 less than it was last year. Um, and then also, um, Lake Country and Fire and Rescue has developed a, uh, a fund balance of their own. And uh, last year, they gave some of that money back to the city. I'm going to last year, I expect it in 2020. And they plan on doing that again in, uh, in 2021. And next year's contribution back to the city will be um, about $27,500 more than what we received uh, in 2020. So it's a positive development. <clears throat> With regards to tourism, we're all aware of the struggles with regards to the hotel industry and, and the uh, hotel taxes that we see uh, from that. Um, and due to that, uh, tourism is unable to include a uh, contribution back to the city in the budget for 2021. Um, this comes after a $104,000 contribution uh, in the 2020 budget. So that was a um, direct decrease of revenue of $104,000. We also saw a loss of, uh, in the 2021 budget, we see a loss of $17,600 in recycling revenue. Uh, in the past, Watchell County partially uh, eliminated their dividends back to municipalities due to changes in the global demand for recyclables. Um, now they uh, permanently, or I should say, they've fully suspended them and um, uh, pending any change in that. So we will not be receiving any dividend income from Washington County next year for recycling. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, uh, the uh, budget A includes a two percent increase for uh, an employee pay. Um, budget B includes a one point one nine percent increase. Uh, both budgets include um, the Washington County Center for Growth, the membership in that organization. Uh, this is the economic development assistance arm of Waukesha County. Um, many uh, Waukesha County municipalities participate in this, and it's an opportunity for us to um, to receive some economic development resources if we're interested in um, pursuing that and enhancing our um, economic development efforts in the city of Milwaukee. That's a four thousand dollar annual annual membership fee. Last thing I just want to mention the general fund 
um, uh, highlights just to make sure that everybody is aware of this. It's a minor issue. Uh, the Bleaker Street uh, stickers haven't increased in price for 10 years, uh, and we are proposing to increase those from $20 to $30, which will raise $200,000. Moving on to the next component of the uh, levy is the library levy. Um, you can see in 2020, the library levy was just signed for $400,000. Uh, based on the minimum funding requirements, um, the uh, library levy is, uh, is, is just over $406,000 in 2021, which is an increase of just over a percent. The next slide provides you with the uh, Bit of a history on where the uh, library budget has gone over the years and what the minimum county contribution is at them. You can see we, we had a period of time from 2014 to 2016 where the minimum requirements uh, required some pretty substantial contributions um, to the, um, <clears throat> the library levy. Uh, since then, there's been a couple of years where the uh, change has actually been negative, and, and then beyond that, it's been very modest to try to see changes in the budget. So the third and last component of the total levy is our debt service levy. Uh, here again, you can see 2020 compared to 2021. There are two um, adjustments that we make to our debt service to get kind of our net debt service that we need to levy for. Um, tourism typically makes contributions um, to help pay for, help fund um, debt service related to trails is something that they've identified as um, appropriate for their funding. Um, again, they were unable to provide a contribution in 2021 for debt service funding. However, back in 2019, uh, they did make an additional contribution that year we used for uh, future uh, debt service related <laughs> trails. Um, and that amount was $32,600. So we found this year to be an appropriate time to use that since they're unable to make that contribution this year. Additionally, the city has a fund balance in the uh, debt service fund. And this fund balance was primarily generated by the fact that. Uh, the city municipal buildings came in about a million dollars under budget. In addition to that, we also put um, development impact fees into this fund balance also and, and use that to pay for our debt service related municipal buildings. And based on a um, steady debt growth model that the council actually approved back in 2011, um, the appropriate contribution used from that fund this year it was just the uh, just shy of one hundred sixty-three thousand dollars, and with those two adjustments, it brings our debt service levy down to um, just over one point nine five million dollars. Just want to circle back real quick and clarify that you know if a referendum is approved, you know how those funds will be used. Um, if the referendum is approved, the city will be allowed to exceed its levy limit by up to $257,608. Um, but as I said, recommended by the day only requires a levy limit exceedance of uh, $191,510 for 2021. This is due to the um, uh, police retirement. They're not filling that position until June. Um, however, the city does need to be aware that. You know, in following year's budget, once that position is in the budget uh, for the full year, and then that position um, you know, passes through the, um, the three years of uh, salary increases from starting pay to veteran pay, uh, we will be at a point uh, where we'll be right around that uh, uh, referendum number as far as what our uh, structural effects it would be. Another bullet point that I, uh, that I mentioned here. This is something that we've talked about for, for many years. Um, the city has in the past chosen um, not to uh, levy up to our levy limits uh, prior to 2017. Uh, and it's kind of a philosophical discussion. Uh, but I just note that the city council, you know, even if we only need $191,000 to balance the budget, the city council may want to consider levying some portion of the difference between what we can allow 
what we have levied and what we need to levy uh, just for future budget flexibility. And then also there are some risks in this budget that are unique, um, specifically with um, uh, projections on both dollar projections. This slide I think kind of demonstrates um, kind of the state of the city budget and what the department has been doing to try to uh, uh, make things work within the levy limits. Um, this shows by department classification how the budgets are going to are proposed to change from 2020 to 2021. Obviously, column uh, the first column is budget A with regards to assuming that we maintain existing staffing levels. Uh, a past referendum and whatnot. And so you can see, even in that scenario, most of the departments, and especially the departments with the largest budgets, um, their, their budgets are going down uh, year over year. Then when you look at budget B and um, you take away a, a police officer and a public works employee and administrator, uh, you can see how the budgets go down even, even further based on those adjustments. One clarification I want to make is um, there was um, um, one inadvertent mistake in the budget that, I, that I've noticed. Um, as far as that Waukesha County Center for Growth budget item, it's inadvertently excluded from the printed detail sheet in the conservation and development section of the budget in the day two, uh, but it is included in, in the budget day and the budget day photos that you see in the budget summaries. Um, so you, if you look closely and you compare uh, the budget summary on page 26 versus the detail on page 82, you will see a $4,000 discrepancy. Um, and that discrepancy is the Washtenaw County Center for Growth budget item. But like I said, it is included in the budget. When you look at the summary, it's just not included in the detail sheet. And we will um, update the budget based on that. And then we'll make the copy, um, new copies of, of that page as we go. So that kind of covers my overview of the budget. I just want to stop right now and see if anybody did have any questions for what we've gone over so far. With that, we will turn it over to the department head and we'll start with Steve with the administration and public services budget. Uh, good evening. I put some bullet points on the slide here. Um, for the most part, the budget is fairly consistent with the past year's budget. I actually started September 23rd, so the budget was pretty much built for me already. Um, after finally getting a chance to review it, uh, I did wanna highlight a couple suggested changes, uh, just mainly shifting things around and actually ending in a, about a 50, $800 savings that could actually be used somewhere else in the budget. But the main highlights, I think Tom mentioned earlier in the presentation with the revenues that LCF and our fund balance distribution back to the city, uh, and then the recycling fund dividend that's being removed at 17,600. As far as the expenditures go, um, hopefully we have only two elections next year. Uh, I did actually take a look at the election budget um, and by my calculations, I could actually see a significant savings. Um, I don't know if in the past it's been one amount and then it's just cut in half every two years or not. Um, I actually calculate out what I'm gonna pay my poll workers um, for working, helping in the office, training, all that. Um, in my budget transmittal letter, I did notice a slight error. <clears throat> there was a, I, I think I said, $2,000 is sufficient. I actually meant to say $20,000. I think it was over $25,000 uh, initially. And then for the most part, the rest of the expenses are similar. Um, as far as the suggested changes go, and this is after the budget notice went out, um, that's when I had a chance to finally actually review it. Um, I do, I do want to increase the membership subscriptions. Uh, I've got Scott in my office who I'd like to be a member of WMCA. Um, and then there's another organization, $30 a year organization um, that I want me and Mary to join. Uh, 
the elections postage was a big concern of mine, obviously with both the pandemic going on as well as the popularity of it, uh, absentee ballots have increased. And the, so we will need extra money in the budget to accommodate for that. Um, and then I just factored in an extra $300 in election specific mileage. I just noticed our election budget doesn't have any uh, mileage in there. And then a decrease of $5,900 in the poll worker costs. So that is it for the clerk services. Does anyone have any questions? So Steve, you're suggesting those are changes that the council could make for the, for the budget when it comes to action. Correct. Um, I think it ended up with Spend about three thousand five hundred sixty-four dollars increase. Yes, that's right. Thirty-five hundred. Um, as far as the capital budget goes, uh, there's actually three components, and I will speak on the first two, uh, and Amy is actually going to speak on the third part. Um, I am proposing the purchase of electronic poll books. Right now, they're called Badger books, um, about a cost of 16000 I did write a request for consideration, a kind of lengthy four-page one, explaining all the benefits to them. Um, I started off obviously with the virus pandemic. They are good to use during that. However, my real idea is to not even purchase them until towards the end of the year and start training on them so I can start deploying them in the February election of 2022. Um, there may be some changes that happen with the current product. Um, so I'd be looking at doing that as far as timing goes. But overall, it does create significant efficiencies. I actually did debut them and work with them in my previous location. Uh, they're great. They're, um, they're electronic poll books instead of the paper poll books. So instead of having, a, if you've ever gone to your polling site, usually they split up the lines, the poll book by alphabet. Here you just have stations very similar to any store you go to. You can go to the next available cashier that does improve uh, voter lines. Um, definitely sig reduces significant human errors. Um, at the end, after every election, we have to take the poll book. Now, keep in mind, we have a presidential election going on right now, and we're gonna have well over 4,000, maybe over 5,000 votes that we have to record into the state system. Right now, we have to take the poll book and go through every single voter and record them in their participation in. This thing, you just take the jump drive out from the book and plug it into a computer and everything's uploaded in 10 minutes. Um, so it turns weeks of work into 10 to 30 minutes because you gotta um, just verify all the numbers and everything. And again, I said it's safer during a pandemic, there's less touching needed, it's touch screen. Um, another benefit, I'm not sure, I kind of alluded to it in my memo, but these things actually tell the poll workers what to say and what to look for. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever worked a poll, but there's a, a 200 page manual of laws that they have to know. Um, there's actually a lot less that they have to remember because these things tell them what to say, what to do. So that's great for training poll workers. And you know, my age group of poll workers is basically 70 plus um, retired people who are just doing this for the civic duty, but they when they start working, they have to learn all sorts of laws. And as I mentioned, it's beneficial to the voters. You can open up those lines. Uh, absentee processing is way easier. Um, it's basically a checklist that you go down. Right now, you have to record voter numbers in two poll books, uh, absentee ballot log, and on the envelope itself. So overall, that's the that's the savings um, on the poll book, the electronic poll books. Yep, That's Steve. Right. Oh. Sorry, I have a quick question. This is Sandra Felker. Oh, um, what's sure what's the useful life of those electronic poll books? How long are they good for? Um, the state, when they first debuted the first batch, said around uh, five to eight to ten years. Um, the thing is, they're just basic point of sale devices mm -hmm. right now. Um, it's the programming that's going to change. And if you have this, the uh, devices or just computers. Um, there's not a whole lot of upgrade uh, as long as we solely use them for that. It's 
the programming and everything in the computer is actually under warranty with the state. So we don't have- Okay, and there's not a subscription fee for keeping them type of thing? No. Okay, cool, thank you. So, um, yeah, there's really not many ongoing costs with them. If you damage one, you might have to repair it. But, um, as far as the express boats go, um, any, if any of you come in during in-person absentee over the next five days, uh, try it out. We, I got two of them, they're over there. Um, had I been here a while ago, I would have purchased more of those instead of more of the uh, tabulation devices since we don't need so, so many tabulation devices on small elections, I would have just rented them for big elections. So I would have purchased more of those. Those things are actually safe safer for voters votes because they don't allow for mistakes. It's big, especially in the August election when you can't cross parties. Um, a lot of people don't understand that. We spoil an awful lot of ballots on election day and during in-person absentee, uh, that won't let you do that. Um, and you know, people don't fill in ovals properly. I wanna make sure voters votes count. So those actually help. Um, so it also reduces human errors. It, it's also safer for a pandemic. Um, and then creates efficiencies on end of the night processing. Um, one of the duties of poll workers is they have to go through every single ballot and look for write-in votes. Uh, those are just, instead of the normal ballot that you see, it's, a, it's still a paper ballot. Um, and then it's a thermal sheet of paper with all of, every, all of the choices that you selected and little arrows to point to the write-in votes. It's very easy to catch. Um, and of course, it's handicap accessible. I've used these. I'm probably the biggest user in the county of these. If I had more, I'd use them. Um, I've had several hearing and vision impaired people come in during in-person absentee voting and use them, and they're very appreciative. They like them. So those are the benefits of the. Is this a cost for one of them, or is that your proposed, or is maybe the rest of them? Um, it's $3,500 each. I'd like to get at least three. Um, so that would be the thought, yeah. And again, there's no programming or anything that's all, uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's maintenance costs that would be coming out of my operating budget. It's um, future maintenance costs. Um, or not, it's a, it's a maintenance like contract we have with all of our voting equipment. It's the same company that we use for all of our voting, voting equipment. Um, I know a couple of municipalities took some of the grant money and purchased uh, several of them, but uh, we've had other uses for our grant money. So, so that's only for in-person voting. That wouldn't uh, affect mail-in or absentee voting at all. Though, no, that's a. I, I think I did mention in my memo that I had to give a disclaimer on this. That depends on if mail-in voting is super popular and, and that's where we end up with those are kind of useless so i did want to make that disclaimer um however we will probably eventually get back to some sort of normalcy and people will start using them during in-person fc there's a handicap accessible voting machines every municipality was given one back in 2006 when the hava act the help america vote act came out and then the county purchased new equipment in 2016 and every municipality was also given one. I think the share was like 70, 30, the county side. Um, so we did already pitch in some for the one we have. I borrowed the other one from the county. All right, with that, I'm gonna, uh, let's see. I gotta unmute Amy so I can have her speak on the next slide. Are you unmuted, Amy? I am. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. Can everyone hear her? All right. So the accounting, Oops, the accounting software that was approved last year um, was intended to include both the regular accounts receivable application for invoicing um, as well as the utility billing application. Um, the, however, the regular accounts receivable application was unintentionally omitted from the original $90,524 quote that was approved. Um, 
I noticed it once we started to convert over to the new system this year, um, shortly after I started in June. Um, without you know, this one module, um, invoices would need to be created and tracked manually. And then we'd have to enter journal entries into the general ledger. Um, and it just, it would be a lot of manual tracking. And so in order to um, use it at its maximum efficiencies and to have everything talk to each other, um, you, you need that AR module. Um, so Civic was pretty understanding and allowed us to convert the accounts receivable module along with everything else. Um, and instead of having to incur that extra expense this year, they agreed to bill us in January um, to be able to include it in our 2021 budget. Um, and then the total cost is $6,900. Um, which Civic also discounted for us. Um, and then we would use the same fund breakdown that was used for the 90,000, which would be 50% um, general fund, 20% for both the water and sewer utilities, and then 10% for the stormwater. Okay, then from there, we'll turn over to the uh, police department. Next slide. Great. Uh, oh, yeah. Talk, you might actually hear me. Um, um, there really isn't much here that, that I haven't presented to the council before. Uh, so once again, our operating budget represents 90% of our. Hey, Chief. Uh, Hang on a sec. I'll give you this. It's easier to pick up on the laptop than I can. My greatest fear of California. <laughs> um, so, the police department funded, there shouldn't be really any big surprises to anybody. It's not anything I ever uh, brought to uh, the council's attention in the past, but including really this year. Um, our operating budget this year represents uh, personnel, represents 90%, over 90% of our operating budget uh, for 2021. There are some uh, issues that have been brought up in the past that are contractual and we can limit to some degree, but I don't have total control uh, over them, including overtime, uh, which can be taken as compensatory time by the members uh, and tuition reimbursement, which is a contractual uh, benefit the police officers have. Um, over the last uh, couple of weeks, we were able to make a few adjustments uh, specifically tuition reimbursement. Uh, we have one member who's currently using that. Uh, she originally wanted to take uh, three classes next year. Uh, she agreed to take one last class. So that took a third of that out of the budget. Um, the biggest development was Officer Dorsey retiring. Uh, she decided to take an early retirement um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, based on that, we would have a vacancy. Um, normally, uh, in normal years, when I know that would, that would be filled, I would have already met with the police commission and begun a hiring process. There seemed to be no sense in doing that in case uh, there was no sense beginning a process if we're not going to fill it. Uh, so I've held off on doing that. Uh, the delay until June is if you've never uh, been involved in hiring a police officer, it takes months and now. Uh, so I'm figuring. If, uh, we're waiting for the final budget to know if that position's in there. Uh, we can start in December. Uh, June seemed like a decent compromise. Uh, we still need the position filled, uh, but it would take us several months to fill it, and it seemed like a decent, uh, like I said, compromise to try to help with the financial situation of the department and still meet the department's needs. The uh, remark retirement is effective when? September 30th. Uh, some of the extra savings that would be realized with the replacement of Dorsey is she was still working under the uh, longevity uh, clause in the contract where she received longevity payments at the end of the year. Any replacement would not, because that was bargained away in the last contract. Uh, 
anyone higher than now would not receive any long really. Um, and also a new uh, uh, a new hire would uh, start on at a lower pay rate than the veteran would, uh, like Dorsey. And they accrue benefit time differently than some of the veteran officers uh, over a longer period of time. So those would be some uh, benefits to the city in filling that long term. Um, otherwise, uh, continue to try to cut where I could while still maintaining services and our operations. Um, stamping is what it is. We've talked about it repeatedly. Um, the other big change, which we discussed, uh, Tom discussed earlier, is moving the purchase of the squad car from operating to capital uh, to remove it from that burden to the capital that um, with longer term financing. Um, there were several other items that at the beginning of the year we were interested in asking for in the capital, but as time went on, we decided that they weren't worth uh, the expense. Uh, the most intriguing one was uh, a newer uh, speed monitoring device, radar, it's actually a laser that it, it takes a picture of the car as you get the reading. So if there was somebody who wanted to contest that you got the wrong car, we would have a picture of the guy that was stopping at the time the violation occurred. Now that would be super if we had problems prosecuting our speeding violations, but we don't. So there is no sense in my adding that to already uh, stress point. Um, so once again, we've uh, we cut, uh, we continue to cut where we can and save where we can. Um, the biggest issue, obviously, is the officer position. Um, I don't, you know, sometimes making the argument, it's almost like I get something from having in that other officer position filled. And it's really, if that's the way anybody thinks of it, it's really, I want to be able to do my job the best I can provide the police services that I know the community expects. And I need the resources to be able to do that. And that's where the staffing position is. Um, so, uh, that's the long and the short of it. There's really no significant, significant surprises in our budget as it is. Okay, thanks, Eric. And then, oh, Alderman Barron, you had a question? I don't think you need to hold it up. Uh, Four shifts with a single officer working. Yeah, the, you know, it's, the way we approve benefit time use, it doesn't run into more overtime unless rare situations where, okay, we're down to one officer shift, that person is sick. You know, I, I can't exactly make them come in when they call that sick, and I have to backfill with an officer sometimes on overtime. Sometimes I can get the officers to be free to do it uh, voluntarily. Uh, but that's pretty rare. Okay, next we'll hear from uh, Stephanie in the library and if she's on Zoom. Make sure she's. I'm here. Hold on just a moment. I need to get my mic back. Okay, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, do you want to flip that? Hang on just a second here. Okay. Oh. Hold on, I gotta go back. Uh, I'm on. Um... <laughs> there you are. Okay. There you go. Okay. So you can hear me? Everybody yeah. can? Okay, great. Um, 
basically, I just wanted to highlight where our um, tax money goes and what we've done with it um, for the past year or so instead of um, talking about our budget for 2021. Um, so for the year 2019, which is the last year we had the statistics um, taken, this, um, the source of this is our DPI annual report. Um, the Delfield Library circulated um, or borrowed out roughly 250,000 items. Um, library patrons also downloaded 37,000 items of electronic material, that's ebooks and e audiobooks. Um, we also sent out 23,000 items of our own to other libraries last year. The library also received 42,000 items for our users here. Um, 366 programs were conducted by library staff for adults, teens, and children, and nearly 7,300 participants attended. Um, our collection is roughly 77,000 items, and over 96,000 visits were made to Delfield Library in 2019 alone. Um, you can flip the, the slide, please, if you would. Um, basically, I just wanted um, to highlight some things that you may not know about us and clear up any misconceptions that you may have uh, had about us. So I'm, I can just kind of go over quickly some, some things that we do and that we do currently and that we've done in the past. Um, we, near, we have nearly 10,000 users um, and a service area of 25,000 citizens. So these patrons choose the Delfield Library because of um, what we have to offer. Instead of going to other libraries, they come to us, which is wonderful. Um, we can order you any item held locally in 24 different libraries throughout Waukesha and Jefferson counties or throughout the state of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and at parts of Iowa too, through our interlibrary loan program. Um, some special collections we offer, um, especially during this time, that are very helpful include Wi-Fi hotspots, Roku devices, Milwaukee County Zoo passes, Betty Brin Museum passes, Art Museum passes, to name just a few. A lot of those are courtesy of our uh, friends of the library, which is very wonderful to have. Um, we are one of the re few remaining free meeting spaces throughout the community. Um, obviously that changed a little bit this year um, with our open hours. We also offer outdoor Wi-Fi, again, courtesy of the Friends of the Library. That is a brand new program that we have done this year during COVID to make sure that our users can use our Wi-Fi even if our building is not always open to them. Um, we offer free database use with your library card. Things like Consumer Report, Ancestry.com, Help Now, which is our newest one, which is a free online tutoring assistance um, for parents and students. Um, those are all paid for by the library at no cost to the citizen. Uh, within, a free of within a week of shutting its doors in March, the library launched fully online programming, um, which was a completely new venture for us. And within a week of the governor's order in April, we fully launched curbside service, another completely new venture for us. Uh, we have now had um, nearly 6,600 customer or curbside interactions since May. Um, we've also been... Um, Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Um, well, I just wrote, um, we're meticulous in the use of our tax dollars to provide these services to patrons. We are. Um, we're industrious. We, we're, the library is nothing more than um, resourceful, so we know how to stretch a dollar when we need to. And those who have any questions about the library or its operations sh um, should visit to experience what this value is, or if, if you have any questions, can certainly speak to me as well. Any Pardon? Are you staff the audience if there's any follow-up questions for you? And seeing none, we go last but not least to our executive director of uh, promotion tourism. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Hi, my name is Doug Smith, and I'm the director for Telephone Tourism. Uh, so we're on the first slide. We all know what COVID has done to the world. So I don't have to go through any of that. So some of the highlights I'd like to keep on. Um, in March, we started reviewing our 2020 budget. Um, we do that every month regardless. But April, um, we did not meet. We were all stay at home. We canceled our meeting. Um, May and after, we continue to look at our financial and 2020 um, expenses. Um, 
we did cut our marketing project by $21,275. Um, a lot of the projects and marketing that our marketing agency of record was going to do, a lot of it circled around with the Dallas field while you're in the sports festival, the Ryder Cup, the Democratic National Convention, etc. So um, a lot of projects. Um, came off of our agent's uh, of plan. $10,000 in printed had already been created and submitted in January, which is typically um, the first four or five weeks in January following approval of the, the budget. Um, our marketing agent record was being created and we get all those submitted to publication. So that was a big cost that couldn't be stopped. And that we had to face. Um, we kind of mentioned some of this earlier, so I won't go into detail, but um, in looking at our financials, um, uh, the 41,776 trail debt bill that is typically used in April, um, that was approved, and the money was transferred from storage to cover that bill. Um, of the intended $104,000, other than uh, the signs that were purchased, um, the tourism commission did ask the city to pause any further spending. And since for this project, the tourism commission can be used for our budget charity concern. Um, there was a huge recreation spike on our trails this year due to COVID-19. Um, the majority of the visitors that stopped by um, the visitor center, we do not have 25 um, visitors. July 22, August jumped to 66. August was a very, very busy month for me. Um, September, 59 visitors, and already um, this month there has been 45. Um, today there was zero because it was a downpour of rain. But sometimes in the inclement weather, you will still see walkers out. And the Ice Age Trail is dealing with a mammoth forty site through the month of October, and that's where a lot of these visitors are discovering Bellfield because of the Bellfield Freedom Trail um, network. And um, the maps and the guides and information are, are flying out there. Um, some lodging booking uh, people will return to the Bellfield for a weekend just because of that event. So um, great news there. Um, over the last few months, is there any questions on any of that? I don't know. Um, so, stimulus grants, we're all looking for money at this point, right? Especially with COVID 19. And over the last few months, Governor Eber has allocated nearly 200 million in uh, care that funding coronavirus patients in the economic security. So, care that funding over the past few months that included a grant of $12 million for local and regional tourism promotion and tourism development organizations uh, requesting assistance. Um, the parameters for requesting assistance needed to be documented in line in January 1st, 2020 and December 31st, 2020. Nothing to carry over into next year. So it's all funding for for um, budgetary concerns for this year. Um, we submitted an application requesting $176,595 in anticipated 2020 loss um, hotel system uh, hotel and, uh, revenue. Um, we got a full receipt of that amount of good fund. We fund our $21,000. $375 that we had pulled. Um, that was the new guide to map in digitally, um, not print. Um, fun to work on our 2020 marketing project. Um, uh, the grant approval could help fund uh, the $92,677 um, out of that 104 that, that we would love to complete this year. Um, for the city, and then additional funds. Obviously, the tourism 
would agree to do this and do the allocation. Um, part of that 200 million is grant opportunities to assist the Wisconsin lodging property. Um, that just came out this week, and so I sent that uh, grant information over to all the DMs so that they, if they didn't see this and they're not following travel with Wisconsin, I know that. Delta Tourism and the Delta Hotel are members, so we see these things right away. Um, and hopefully they'll act on it, and I'm going to give them all comments to make sure. Um, so the good news. Tuesday afternoon, after I've already submitted all of my um, uh, PowerPoint thing. Um, I looked at email and I received notification that Delta Promotion Tourism had been selected to receive a marketing stimulus grant award for $50,837. Um, the checking letter of requirements rules on how to apply the grant award will be sent to um, the tourism mailbox. That I will receive the need. Um, and then all information will be taken to the tourism commission and reviewed. Um, obviously, that marketing um, uh, funding that we cut, um, I assume, will be one of the things that we'll use that money for. Regardless, everything has to be by um, uh, uh, spent spent by December 31st of this year. It cannot carry over in So more information on, on how that will be um, like the dice once I get the check and not the rules um, of how to apply the grant. So that's my exciting um, And then the next slide, which is very unclear, um, I have no big one in front of me. Um, we've only received the first and second quarter um, of hotel uh, from from the hotel. And first quarter wasn't a concern at all. Um, Four thousand dollars under what was expected and what we uh, received in 2019 wasn't a concern. Although the pandemic wasn't. The daily word of our speaker. I mean, you know, um, during the time people were still visiting um, our hotel. Second quarter, there was a 61.7% difference between 2019 and 2020. Um, and third and fourth quarter, we have no idea. There, there, there's only one hotel, I think, that has turned something in. I don't expect it to be good news at all. Third or fourth quarter. So obviously, planning is hard. When the hotels can even provide information um, about what their expectations are, what their future bookings are, the only response we can see is everyone's canceling their reservations, right? So I don't think I need to go over. Um, with any further because I don't have um, anything else to say other than the first and second quarter. Um, so then to the back slide. Um, a few highlights on the 2021 budget. Um, the Tourism Commission um, chose to budget on 111000 um, we'll hear that number later, I think, from Tom, um, or we already heard it, I'm not sure, that's the last number. Um, marketing per Act 55, 51% um, of the total budget needs to be spent on marketing. And so, in breaking out operations and marketing out of that $111,000 budget, $54,000, um, P90 will be, um, has been planned in operation with. Um, 56,610 plans for a use in marketing, which is um, typically where that 104 would come out of. 
um, in the normal years for the quality of what is positive on market and promoting the market and development. Um, there is no contribution, as was mentioned, um, you know, for the city uh, for 2021 as of right now. Um, I'm always hopeful. But um, that reduced our budget by $145,000 um, at this point. And uh, $10,000 um, was also deducted from our uh, marketing agent of record. Um, marketing agent of record, um, their contract will be $40,000 plan will be due their first proposal at the November towards the meeting. Um, and that $10,000, um, it was important for the tourism commissioners to put that $10,000 into an event category um, for events that would likely generate an overnight stay, which is a full from activity spot. Um, so that's your plan, and nothing further has been decided on, on what actually will, will occur with, with that. $10,000. Um, uh, additionally, in our 2020 budget, 2021 budget top, um, annual membership dues for uh, a variety um, of, of uh, nonprofits and partners. Everything was cut except the dedicated Hanson Hotel and Lodging Association. They're a vital part for tourism and like the Southern tourism. Um, I know there's a tenant that vacated this year. Um, I'm going to be talking, um, speaking with the tourism commission as an agenda item at the November meeting. Um, I feel uh, quite confident that from January to um, April, um, that Delta tourism can handle that need for gas electric bill. But obviously, that's a decision that, that the tourism commission will make. Um, they don't know about this this issue that that is raised. And I'll talk to them about that. Um, the lease item, the lease budget item we had in our budget was released. Um, as was staining the extra door frame of all of the cosmetic improvements that we've been budgeting for and trying to accomplish over the last two years to help maintain that building. Um, 50% of replacing the air conditioner in our furnace uh, remains in the tourism budget. And those are the highlights. A lot of cuts, more than our budget is less than half of what this year was. All right, thank you, Bill. Next, we'll move on to the capital improvements program. And uh, I'd ask to follow on to your turn to page 111. Uh, in your budget books. So the graph that we show here up on the, on the slide here uh, shows the history of our capital um, uh, project borrowing. Uh, the yellow and blue bar graphs uh, identify each year um, what was requested in the budget versus what was adopted by the council in the budget. So I think it shows a clear pattern of council scrutiny of projects and, and significant reductions between uh, requested and adopted budgets. Uh, then the line graphs also show the uh, funding for the borrowing, uh, with the red line being the general fund borrowing, uh, the black line being uh, other funding, which typically means uh, funding by utilities or grants or whatnot. Then the dash green line also shows the actual uh, borrowing that we did each year. Uh, sometimes we borrow a little bit less than what was adopted uh, because we got some uh, funds on hand from that project that were underspent or whatnot. All right, going to the budget book on page 111. Um, we'll look through real quick uh, each of the Projects proposed for the 2021 budget. Um, the schedule from pages 111 to 114 identifies all the projects. Uh, and then from pages 115 to 172 provides all the backup documentation uh, for individual uh, projects that includes uh, various uh, 
uh, cost estimates, um, maps that were created, uh, memo justifying projects, things like that. We'll start off with an item that was uh, actually in the budget for, uh, it was in the recommended or requested budget for 2020. Uh, the council took action to remove it from the 2020 budget and direct the staff to include it in the 2021 budget. Uh, it's a, uh, a boat pier at St. John's Bay. Uh, it would be a pier that could provide uh, 13 slips for pontoon uh, boats and another 13 slips for personal watercraft. The intention with this uh, dock is to provide boaters with uh, connectivity and access to downtown so that uh, boaters can park their boat. Uh, use the different restaurants, uh, shopping, and various amenities in downtown, uh, and then get back to the voting. Um, the Lake Welfare Committee is still considering this item. Uh, last year, they did recommend this item, but they are reconsidering it this year, and they do plan to uh, discuss it further uh, at their November meeting, which will be just a few days before the council's action on the budget. Uh, there is also a proposal, you'll see this in the backup documentation included, um, following the schedule, there's a proposal to um, provide some of the split for private rental. Uh, that could then be a revenue source for the city that would uh, pay off the cost of the um, uh, of the improvement over a series of years. Any questions on that project? If you rent the split, then people can't park. So you Like sort of the piece to it. Yeah, so the proposal, um, I think, I think was to make six of them available for private rental and seven for public use. And that's a proposal that the um, Lake Welfare Committee is still considering. Um, they would make a recommendation to the council. The council can do what they would like to that. Uh, you know, obviously, this project could be done with making it. All fully available to the public, or, or kind of a, a blend between public and private. Mm -hmm. Concerns. I mean, anytime you have scenes and, and, and you know people get concerned, 
no matter what the topic is, you can play with this very strong support. And there's no scientific data to do that. Well, I know in our area, not a lot of access. You know, we have a fish bone block there, 17, so it's very flexible. It's just all the time. So there's always a desire for lay people. And I have to come out of all the time to have an outlet for tax in the downtown area. One thing that I also have with this project is I have identified that this project would be eligible for uh, a road recreational boating facility grant uh, from the DNR as a transient dock. Um, that would provide 50% funding for a project like this. However, whatever portion of it we might make uh, available as private rentals, uh, that would be excluded from eligibility for grant funding. And so it would be a prorated amount. So if, if half of the facility was private rental, then only half of it would be eligible for funding. And then we could get half of that paid for through the grant. Moving on, the next item is the Fish Hatchery Sports Complex parking lot. Uh, this parking lot is in very poor condition. Um, I encourage you to take a look at it to, uh, uh, to, uh, to see that for yourself. Uh, and the uh, cost to uh, repave that parking lot is uh, a little over $82,000. Uh, next uh, item in the budget is there's a proposal to move the city ice skating rink. Uh, from Oakland Park uh, to St. John's Park. It would require some significant regrading of the area. And um, we've received some folks from our contractors and it would cost $10,000 to, uh, to do that. And can I just add on that? Um, I understand, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it actually creates a little recession in the ground and may eliminate the need for the setting up of the historical size and so forth and literally just flood the area with water and then just maintain it. it, it, it you know, reduce the cost of setting up and moving down here. Is that your understanding? I, I wasn't aware that that was part of the proposal. Okay. Yeah. Based on the discussion I had with Sean, he brought it up with um, the Park and Rec Committee. Uh, that I believe that's the thing. We'll get that confirmed in the next you know, There is a it would be cheaper, I believe, to do it this way than what we can do. I know for sure that the DW guys have said it would be cheaper just based on the fact of how much closer it is uh, to their shop and with regards to saving time on the maintenance that they do uh, for the ice cream rink. It is a significant effort. If I remember right, uh, I believe we spend about 350 hours a year uh, maintaining that rink. It's the highest, the largest number of hours we cut if we have to do something like this for a single project for that ice cream rink. Very, very, very expensive. Yeah, so I, I, I'm just regurgitating what I learned while I was on the park and school. They do a, an annual tour of the park and I've been doing that for the last six or seven years. And they thought it would be significant, would see significant increased use if it was moved downtown. Yeah, that's very good. And parking is not an issue for that. Well, there's always a parking downtown, but it's always amazing to me how people find a way. So I don't know if you know this or not, but this, the city's ice skating used to be on St. John's Pond. Um, St. John's Pond was dredged, and after it was dredged, it introduced it, it opened up some springs into that, and then the ice became very unsafe. We actually had um, a DPW guy in a on a piece of equipment in a cab go underwater uh, by going through the ice. Um, and, and so based on uh, the inability to uh, consistently have safe ice. Uh, that's why we moved the, the ice skating to uh, open park and we do the kind of rink that we have now. Um, you know, we, we did different um, standards for thickness of ice and how many, um, 
many holes it had to drill to see what the thickness was. Uh, but it got to the point where the ice was so consistent that many winters it was literally would be a couple of days where it was cold enough where we'd get adequate ice and then it would warm up. And throughout a whole winter season, there was only be meet our standards for a few days. So that's a little bit of history on that. Uh, there is a warming house there. So that's another thing that goes into the equation. Uh, it's a nice amenity for our state. All right, next we got our uh, annual public uh, space tr uh, tree planting. Uh, in the backup documentation of the CIP, you will see the city five year plan. Um, it is very detailed. It has maps showing exact locations of species uh, to be planted. Uh, this is completely funded by the developer tree fund. Uh, so, no taxpayer dollars involved with this. And um, one thing to note is when you look at the plan, um, here's 2021 and 2023 were flipped. Um, we primarily do to um, 2021 was going to do a bunch of planting on Mission Road and Mission Avenue. And we still have the issue of uh, discussing potential paths out there. And we didn't want to do tree planting uh, in advance of the possibility of flood paths. So uh, if you look, there is a, a one page sheet of minutes from the tree board where they identify. Um, Flipping the 2021 and 2023 tree planting. And if we have questions about some of these maps, Thomas, because that's really good. And the tree planting maps? Yeah. Um, the best contact would be the city forester, Sean. He's going to put those all together. All right, the next item, this is another one that was in the uh, budget for 2020. The council uh, directed staff to remove it. They, they removed it and directed it to be included in the 2021 budget. Uh, there is a drawing of this in the back of documentation. Uh, basically what this does is, is it expands the, um, the VMR entrance area on the south side of the bridge of the Mark River. Uh, by putting in more of a concrete plaza area, more for the gutter. Uh, but uh, the negative associated with the project is it does take away some of the parking spots uh, from the municipal parking lot. Uh, the cost of that is just over $20,000. Next, we go to our annual street improvement program, and we've uh, significantly reduced the program, uh, the proposed program for next year. Uh, there's only one street that we're going to do next year, and that's Lakewood Court. Uh, we're also looking to, um, we've, we've had a lot of success. We're doing um, some significant uh, miscellaneous patches throughout the city where we're able to, uh, at a fraction of the cost of resurfacing, uh, add five years or more onto the lifespan of various roads. Uh, so we got uh, uh, various miscellaneous patches in the budget for next year. Uh, uh, and then, um, like I said, the only role we're doing is, is Lake Court next year. One of the reasons we're doing significantly less roads next year is two, a few of the roads that were proposed to be done next year are in areas that are going to, are expected to uh, uh, be subject to heavy construction in the next couple of years. Uh, two of the roads are over uh, Milwaukee Street, west of Genesee Street, uh, and then also Dockland Street. And obviously, that will be something to have construction roads for the uh, Hendricks project. And then Kemal Park East also is one of the roads uh, that is due for resurfacing. And uh, Tannis uh, company is planning on doing a, um, uh, an expansion of their manufacturing uh, building over there. So that's another reason why we held off on some of the things for next year. Any questions on that? Gives me too easy this year. All right, next project. Um, similar to Bangwood Road in 2020, there is a uh, bike path included in the 2021 budget. If you recall, both of those projects were in the 2020 budget. The council approved the Bangwood Road uh, project for 2020 and directed that the Oakwood Drive project be moved to 2021. Uh, so that is in the budget uh, for next year at a cost of eighty five thousand dollars, and the alignment of that path is shown in the uh, in the backup documentation. 
street signs is a uh, item that we long ago moved from operating budget to the capital budget uh, based on levy limits and trying to increase our flexibility with levy limits. Uh, Size so once again in for $5,000 as is been typical. Then we move into the public works capital equipment items. There are four items proposed for replacement next year. Uh, Foreman Paul Downer has a detailed memo in your backup documentation that goes through um, all four of those items, identifies the current status of those items, the, uh, the useful life, uh, where we are in the useful life, uh, maintenance issues, uh, what the cost is, uh, how it will be funded between different uh, funds, and then lastly, what the expected salvage value is. And those four items include the uh, replacement of the DPW chipper, a uh, cost of $70,000. Replacement of a stand-up mower, uh, a cost of $9,000. Replacement of the city bucket truck, at a cost of $145,000. And replacement of a 12-foot uh, trailer, at a cost of $2,700. Next, we move into the general government outlay. Uh, most of these items Steve had talked about in this presentation in terms of the first one we'll talk about. Uh, if you recall, last year the city uh, approved $12,000 for a downtown economic development plan. Um, however, when we went to uh, uh, get a, um, we actually went to the UW Extension to perform that work. And the actual cost of the payment is significantly higher than what the estimate that was provided at the time to Roger Dubler. Um, the actual estimate for the work is $26,000. Uh, so we are proposing an additional $14,000 next year's budget uh, to combine with the $12,000 this year's budget <clears throat> to, to fund that, uh, that project. Beyond that, the general government, we do have the um, account receivable module that Amy talked to you about. Uh, and then we've got the uh, electronic poll books and the trust loan machines that uh, Steve talked to you about. Moving on to public safety outlay, um, the city has a uh, amount of fuel just over $5,000 per year in capital outlay for the Washoe County Trump radio system. There is a memo in your uh, budget book regarding that. Uh, and then, as we talked about a couple times already, uh, the uh, spy farm was moved uh, along with the equipment for that from the operating budget to the capital budget. Next, we move into the Lake Country Fire and Rescue outlay, and we identify the city portion of. Uh, their 2021 capital funding is over $166,000. Uh, the two uh, pieces of equipment they're looking to purchase next year are identified in the backup documentation. And what you also see is that in order for the city in the future uh, and also the other municipal partners in the fire department to take advantage of the uh, joint fire department credit for the levy limit. We need to make sure that the total budget, uh, which includes operating uh, and capital, goes up each and every year. Because uh, if it doesn't go up, you can't take the credit. And the amount it goes up has to be less than CPI plus, plus 2%. So, what we don't want to do is have a budget that spikes up and down from year to year, uh, because then in the downward spikes, we would be able to take that credit. Uh, so, what they're doing with that is you look at the schedule provided in their backup documentation. Uh, during certain years, including next year, they're funding their capital um, fund um, more than required in building up a reserve. And then in heavy years, uh, they are uh, spending more than what we are, what they're levying to the partner communities. Um, and in particular, uh, there's a year coming up, I think it's around 2026 or 27, something like that. Um, when the ladder truck is due for replacement, and that's an expense of nearly a million dollars. So, what we don't want to do is have a significant spike in that year, and that's how we're addressing that. The next item under Lake Country Park Rescue is their plyometric vent system, which is basically their uh, exhaust removal system uh, in their uh, garage bays. 
Uh, the system they've been using uh, came from when the fire department was located here at City Hall. So it's quite adequate. That is improvable. I don't know. <laughs> Um, but it's been it's been due for repairs for several years now. Um, it actually is a carcinogen concern, and, and there is a liability uh, concern with regard to that. And so uh, the amount to fix that uh, is in the budget for next year, uh, which is nine thousand dollars. Moving into the utilities, which are not uh, funded by uh, taxpayer money, but rather by the users of the utility. Uh, we do have two buildings next year that are due for uh, roof replacements uh, in the water utility. That's the uh, well number one uh, uh, pump house, which is at uh, the intersection of uh, Gulf and Highway 83. And then also the booster station, which is on California. And that addresses all of the capital budget uh, for next year. If you look back at the um, the slide that you have on capital funding, you'll see it's the lowest capital budget we've had since 2012. First time we've done below a million dollars. So um, certainly it was sensitive to current uh, budget conditions. And uh, uh, that concludes my um, my presentation. So with that, I would like to open it up to general discussion amongst the council and then question and answer on um, things that the staff can help you with. Invariably, there's a lot of water that I don't like, but 
started out, you know, I don't know, 70, 80 percent of people seem to really like to think they got You know, as the majority of support people in the building. What I want to do is organize this so we're addressing that support. I think we should revisit that discussion. And so if I can add to that, uh, I, I would concur completely to have a complete plan in mind because the Highway 83 off ramp on I 94 and we found this could be built by. State and in the city's current plan, which was done in 2015, there should be a path going under the underpass there to connect the hotel to the target area, um, to the quick trip there. And that was just reconstructed, and there's no, no accommodations for testing or anything there. I realize the rest of the path doesn't exist, but it's now been constructed, reconstructed by the state to be three lanes because. Make that accommodating to any type of like that. I think you get an opportunity that others have a plan going to that. Uh, in where these opportunities lie, if there's more affordable ways to do them and get them done sooner. I see. Like look at what comprehensive plan that be done sooner. And this is a good example of the get others to help pay. I'll keep in the morning a little bit. It was very years ago in the 83 and 1940. You see a lot of side And uh, basically, projects weren't approved without them. And that's why they're there. And uh, putting them in later is hard. But I never thought of that point. So we would really be forced that uh, corner. I think we could get through it. So, yeah, it's more than just hopeful. I just think that there's an opportunity here. No one's made that observation when they do Highway 83 and someday they're going to. We're going to see a bike trail. I've made that observation to someone who doesn't have it. But we should say, we should assume that it's coming and we should be back. So we can find that back as well. We'll try to come up with something for us. And, and I think Dan. The unique opportunity is we have a city chairman of the thing that's been in 30 years. He's one of these days that's been sad not doing anything. And we're going to lose a lot of institutional memory. I think I'm a big supporter of the next year. And I haven't got this. So, just real quickly, what the public works committee is waiting for before we start uh, that planning process uh, is we're waiting for the completion of the five year park and rec plan. And time to use that as a starting document. Uh, that includes uh, a, a trail map through the city, the public trail map. Uh, and we've been waiting for that uh, you know, for the uh, better part of this year. Um, so, with regards to Highway 83, I think the state did the new ramp itself, right? Nothing along 83, right? right. Um, if you try to pass over, if you go underneath that 94 and try to go to target from the north to the south. You have to go. There is no, you know, there's nothing as far as traffic to go over lane markations for a pedestrian to walk through it. It's not even supposed to be reserved for the bike. Yeah. Now, I would encourage you to go take a look at um, where the bike path goes underneath 994 and Cushing Park Road, how they shell the bike path into an underpass like that. And it's a significant expense and a significant undertaking. And I'm confident that that's not. Anything that they were looking to undertake now. And then Jim also mentioned um, current DOT policy is any kind of path or sidewalk along DOT is 100% local funded. Now, I understand that. You know, I understand that, but it's been brought to every point in it. So, you know, some people are paying for You can get grant um, to whatever you had with a plan. You know, this is always a two, three year look. Absolutely. And if you have a plan, get the heads up, lock it this thing. Absolutely. Especially when they. We really got to get better at introducing projects five years out. 
So staff has the flexibility and ability to take a look at funding availability. Uh, we're not up against you know funding deadlines to get in and things like that. Um, the intention of a five-year capital improvement plan is almost all projects should be introduced into a five-year plan. There should never be any kind of oh we'd like to have this project next year unless it really has some kind of unique urgency to it. With that said, we don't putting things in there that we don't ever get to. And then we not come up the year before. So I think we have to think we should try and honor that. So, Jim, did I, you said you wanted to revisit this discussion at the next meeting. You talk about the uh, next council meeting? I, I guess that's when we make our final decision, right? Oh, two meetings from now. Okay. Two meetings from now. And I'm still thinking about this because, yeah, it's got a lot of people in my home place, so let's put this in the end. I don't know how the doing it. I know it's a about efficient use of funds. Well, if Alderman Grimmer's not here, but my understanding is that for the first phase of Old Foot, and I'd like to get confirmation of this, that he talked to those people and that there's almost uniform uh, uniformity as far as people being in favor of it. And that, is, and that small section connects all that subdivision. I'm aware that it's a, it's a small investment that I don't care what master plan we have, it's always going to have a plan that goes along that road. We're, we're in here. So it's a whole year. So we have an extensive one in the world, but that's clearly what it's called. This is clearly what it's going to go. This makes kind of sense. Right. And it's relatively short, and it serves a lot of people quick. I, I, I want to also say that the unintermittent with the plan, with the people that are going to work on I think we got to be a little bit more aggressive. So just to clarify, when you say revisit the discussion, you're not talking about a formal agenda item, but rather in the context of the budget discussion. Okay. <laughs> Any other points of discussion or questions and answers this evening? That usually comes out of this meeting with a bunch of homework. Uh, well, I, I don't have the strongest community awareness, but um, as an owner of a lot of things, farm land, um, you know, the owner has about 25 percent of the handle of equipment for public work. And I, I, you know, I read the report as far as the W, you know, the Scott, whatever, the Department of Transportation recommended a certain year shelf life or nine years life, certain equipment. And, and that might be the case, but if someone says my car has a five year life or ten year, that doesn't mean I necessarily get rid of it or it's very functional. Um, in the case of like a chipper, is it do you use that chipper every day where it's functional life is deteriorating it to the point that it really needs to be replaced? Or is it if, if can we extend the life of these pieces of equipment longer than what is necessarily on the book? Say money, not just this year, but this and years. In the future, I mean, I, well, I drive around, I see the city has a lot of really nice pieces of equipment. Um, I drive around a lot of agriculture farms. We drive around with 20 year, 30 year old tractors and stuff like that. It's funny why new equipment needs to be first of all kind of functional. And I'm not saying that it's not, I'm not saying that it's fully functional. I'm not saying it needs to be uh, not replaced, but I'm just saying that that's something that should be reviewed a little bit more. So this, this equipment probably can last another two or three years. And then not only this one, but two or three years of equipment also last longer. Just an observation and comment more than an opinion. Yeah, um, and we do uh, look at that all the time. Um, if you look at our capital equipment replacement schedule, um, we've got a useful life for equipment that's identified as a purchase, and we're constantly you know, moving it back because it's still working good, things like that. Um, if I remember right, I, I'm Try to look at it real quick. But I think that chipper had a, a 10 year useful life, I think around 14 years, I think, if I recall correctly. And um, I'm not sure it'd be a fair statement for me to say that that chipper gets used every single day, but it gets used um, extremely heavily. I mean, several days every week for sure. 
The other thing I'll throw out there is if any council member want to see the equipment, um, give Paul Zeller a call. Um, stop by the, the shop. And um, he knows more about it than I do. He also has a really good feel about resale value and the best time to, um, to recommend getting rid of equipment. Um, we've got a lot of really good stories about, um, uh, first of all, we, we get to buy equipment in the United States. Today. So what, what we're able to get it for is usually less than um, what, what most, most people can buy it for. We've got a lot of stories about where we buy a tractor for $27,000, use it for eight years, and get $22,000 down. That's the point. So I know the retail value is that in the budget from a hundred and I think there's two hundred and twenty six thousand dollars of capital equipment purchases. The trade and value has that been determined if you know mark back into it or is that not been so are we spending three hundred thousand of extra getting you know seventy thousand trade in so that net cost is within thirty that's the budget. So so the, the resale value uh, what we expect to receive from the equipment is included in the revenue in the operating budget. And you'll see, right, that's yeah, you'll see it, a line item for uh, sales of highway equipment. So, I mean, that's, that's another point too, is if we, if we were to cut something out, we, we do need to adjust that line item as well in the operating budget. Right. So, yeah, on a different topic, uh, I guess it's kind of dependent upon whether we recommend it fast or not, but if it is, do you know if we would reach that certain mark to qualify for the expenditure exchange program? I know we have to have a certain low rate of qualification. Yeah, we, we would not. We have to have a low rate of at least five dollars. Okay. All right. Looks like we don't have any more questions, and I don't believe anybody has their hands on mine. So I, I do have one more question. Sorry, um, I wasn't sure when I could ask, but I was just curious if we had an update on some of the um, development that was supposed to go downtown. I know that that's uh, something that will have a long term impact on our revenues um, if we are able to get new buildings in downtown, and I've noticed that things aren't. Uh, starting, so just wasn't sure if there was an update to provide to everyone. No, I mean, when people ask us that question, Sandra, we basically look for the that, that would be referring to, right? I'm sorry, it's it's really hard to hear, so I, I heard no, but I couldn't hear uh, kind of what else was said. That question, Sandra, we are usually. We refer them to the Hendricks group. I assume you're talking about the two buildings downtown. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you want to know what the question is, you'll have to reach out to them. They're, they're owners of that process at this point. I understand. I would just assume that this the city would be communicating with them. So you're not, is what you're saying? No, that's absolutely not what I'm saying. But we do check in with them periodically and they tell us that they're working on it. So if there are more specifics than that, I would expect to reach out to them directly. Okay. And Sandra, also, I'll also chime in that earlier this year, um, they gave uh, me an indication that they thought they'd be ready to break ground uh, late this fall, early winter. Right, that's um, when I talked to Rob, that's what he said, but I, I've noticed that nothing's well, happened, yeah. More, more recently, we've got an update uh, that they're likely not gonna break ground until spring. Okay, okay. Thanks. All right, not seeing anybody else. I will officially say that we are now adjourning from the workshop meeting at 7.44. Enjoy the debate. Thanks everybody. Thank